Okay. So I am going to now introduce today's presenters. We've got Rochelle Gray and Cynthia Ewers Cobb, and they are some great colleagues who are board certified behavior analysts and speech and language therapists, dually certified. And they uh, honored us last year and they did a presentation for our BAME panel that we did discussing uh, behavior analysis and issues around racism and so on. And they were kind enough to join us today again, but they're gonna be discussing something slightly different. They're gonna be talking about collaborative training, collaborative work, working in interdisciplinary settings and so on. Something that I think is particularly important um, for uh, people in our field. Now, before I pass on to our presenters and ask them to share their screen, let me just shamelessly plug the Fizard Center as always. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Thanos Bostanis. I am a lecturer here at the Fizard Center at the University of Kent, where we have two ABAI verified courses in applied behavior analysis and positive behavior support. Now, as part of our effort to disseminate behavior analysis globally, thanks to the internet, we are doing this monthly journal club where we ask people to share uh, their expertise and to help us improve our practice and do better for our clients and the people we support. If you want to check out Tizard, please go to uh, our website, which is tizard.org. So if you just Google tizard.org, it should bring up our website. And we've got also courses in autism and intellectual developmental disabilities. And we also have a lot of PhD opportunities. If any of you are considering doing some research with us, we would love to hear from you guys. So do check our website out. Now, I'm going to say three key words during the session. And I would like you guys to email me those three key words, along with your full name as you wanted on your um, certificate and your BACB uh, certification number, not your account number. So the three key words, your full name and your BACB certification number, and I will prepare your CEUs and send them to you within about a month. Please do so by the end of the week because it helps me process them quickly and send them to you before the um, month passes. You will also notice that you've got the option to use uh, the button that says Q&A. So if you hover over your screen with your mouse, you will see there's a button that says Q&A. So if you've got any questions for our presenters, you can either use the chat box, the usual chat box that I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with if you've ever used Zoom, or you can use the Q&A uh, function and we are going to be keeping track of both of them. Um, so either way, if you've got any questions, feel free to just type them away and we are going to share them with our presenters so that they can um, answer your questions. Okay, apologies for the long introduction. Um, oh, also this is going to be uploaded on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and go on and search for Tizard Center, it's going to bring up our YouTube channel, which we are in the process of updating and you're going to be able to find our journal clubs uh, uploaded there. Okay. Cynthia, Rochelle, thank you very, very much for joining us today. And okay. I'm not going to take more of your time. Please just say a few words about what you're currently, uh, uh, what, you know, what, what you're currently working on, what you're being involved in and then take it away. And we are most excited to hear your presentation. Okay. Do you want to go first, Rochelle? Or do you want me to go first? Um, I mean, we've got a tiny little bit of it on our slides, um, but essentially we both are in independent practice and our own businesses. Um, I think dipping our toes in both speech and language therapy and uh, ABA. Um, I think we're both also really feeling really strongly um, just about cultural diversity um, and just kind of the move from the BACB into what we're going to be doing and what things are going to look like for us here in the UK um, in a few years. Do you want to add anything, Cynthia? Um, yeah, I, I mean, other than, yeah, I'm very passionate about diversity and very passionate about ABA developing in this country 
alongside other professions, which is partly why we both um, we both qualified as BCBAs first, and then we went to do uh, the SLT, which is like quite unusual. There's not that many of us, but it's quite unusual um, because we feel so passionate about ABA. We want we we can see how important it is to work with other professions, um, and that was part of the reason why we're doing this presentation today. Um, but also part of the reason why we kind of chose the career path that we chose. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, guys. Okay, okay. so um, if you could share your screen, hopefully we've set up everything so you can easily do this now. Okay, I can do that. Okay, can everyone see? Can you see the presentation? I'm going to... Yes, I can. I think I have to make you a bit smaller there because it's a bit weird. Otherwise, <laughs> I'll just take this off. Okay, cool. So... Oops, let's go back. Um, do you want me to go through the learning objectives, Rochelle, or do you want to do it? Um, yeah, it's fine. You can go through them. Okay, so um, so the idea of today's talk is to talk about um, collaboration. Um, there was an article that we sent you to, to pre-read, but we're also using um, a research project by um, a fantastic um, SLT who's also um, done the Masters in ABA, uh, Tara. I don't know if she's here. Um, so we'll be going through that and talking about how um, we can collaborate together uh, as, an S as SLTs and as BCBAs. Um, we'll cover scope of practice from both professions. Um, we'll talk about some barriers to SLT and ABA collaborations. Um, we'll talk about strategies for enhancing collaboration in a bit of detail. Um, and then we'll take some questions at the end. Um, we also have some questions through a poll, so hopefully that will work, um, just to kind of get you thinking a little bit about what your scope of practice is and um, perhaps comparing it to an SLT and how you can collaborate um, together. Yeah, and we'll probably also just add here that um, if you do have any questions that you want us to answer at the end, um, maybe just pop them in to the Q&A section and mm -hmm. hopefully um, we can get through as many of those as we can. Um, I don't know if Thanos, if you want to mediate that um, at, at the end um, we can just go through we've kind of left a bit of time for that yes happy to don't worry uh, and I've got the poll sorted as well so just Perfect. let me know when you would like me to make it available cool uh, yeah that's good right yeah let's do it now before we start yeah I think that's a good idea okay let me actually exit oh how exciting okay hopefully everybody can see this Okay, so the idea is just read through the question, think about the answer, and then we'll go through um, we'll go through the answers at the end. Cynthia, don't be tempted to answer here. <laughs> I was gonna. I was going to. So you wouldn't be able to. Oh, okay. I was thinking I don't have an answer option. I can just see yeah. the presenters can't vote. Yeah. <laughs> We've got some votes coming in now. Ooh, yes. If anybody has any issues, guys, just let me know in the chat box and I'll try and help. We also have Phil here, our IT wizard. We might be able to help. Doesn't mean only one person has answered. Is that just two? Oh, yeah, they're, if they're coming in slowly. <laughs> So we'll give everyone two minutes yeah. and then we'll go through the answers. Do you have the answers, Rochelle? <laughs> <laughs> I just got okay. <laughs> These are very interesting. Mm, um, it is, isn't it? Answers are, yeah.
Okay, one more minute and then we'll... Yeah, there, we've only got about nearly eight left. Yeah, yeah. I like that everyone's taking their time to think about. Mm. You know. Oh, ninety percent nearly there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so five people <laughs> get those answers in. Oh, one more person. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the remaining five are just like hovering there. It's not going up. There we go. Don't worry, we can't identify you from your answers. <laughs> oh, yes, I've made it anonymous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So honestly, Imagine. Yeah, answer <laughs> honestly, we won't shame you, promise. Yeah. <laughs> Right, shall we go through the, oh, someone's just. Yeah, there's only three people left. So. Okay. Okay, so uh, for question one, a four-year-old mm -hmm. child you're working with is very hard to understand. The child can imitate more than 15 single sounds, but whole words or sentences are difficult to understand. For example, the child says, gig doggy, <laughs> instead of big doggy. Okay, so we had, um, one percent, sorry, two percent. Um, one person thought that that should be um, a behavior analyst. Mm -hmm. um, we had thirty-eight percent think that was speech language therapist, and sixty percent saying both. So this is very interesting. Um, I mean, Cynthia and I <laughs> obviously created these questions. Uh, so we said that this essentially should be assault um, because it's more of an articulation issue and then maybe more processing um, going on behind the scenes that really a speech and language therapist should be focused on. Um, Cynthia, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, so the, we put the, the gig goggy uh, in as a bit of a, um, uh, what's the word, as a distractor. Mm -hmm. The actual, the, the, the word gig instead of big, um, the g sound is made at the back of the mouth um, instead of the, uh, sound which is made at the front of the mouth which usually signals that actually there is it's not just a speech and language delay but it's actually a disorder mm -hmm. that's something that a speech and language therapist would be able to pick up on and a behavior analyst wouldn't be able to pick up on because you, you don't have the training so that's why you'd need that's why we're saying in that particular instance you would actually need to have a, a proper assessment articulation assessment from a speech and language therapist to decide okay actually it's a disorder it's not a delay and we need to work on these particular sounds the other thing is um, sounds, uh, articulation sounds need to be taught developmentally. So it's not just a case of figuring out what what the, what ch what the child likes uh, and then just kind of working on things that are reinforcing it. You know, you have to teach things in a developmental order and in a particular way. And the speech and language therapist has the training to be able to do that. So it's not to say that you couldn't work alongside a behavior analyst, but really the speech and language therapist should be taking the lead on that type of um, yeah. program. And just to add there as well, um, the speech and language therapist really will be able to sort of differentially diagnose whether it is a disorder or a delay. Yeah. Um, as great as we are as behavior analysts, yes. <laughs> that is actually out of our remit. Um, as much as we can, you know, work on um, shaping, fading, all of those sort of things. Generally speaking, with this sort of phonological um, process going on, mm -hmm. speech and language therapist would be better suited to lead at least okay yeah. let's go to number two um so you have a 12 year old client who needs to work on social skills she's struggling to find someone to sit with at lunch so we had um 44 percent um say it should be a behavior analyst two percent speech language therapist and 54 percent saying both which is great because Cindy and i also said it would be both yeah definitely um, both yeah I mean, both professions have really strong skill sets in, you know, social skills building. And um, I think that especially working together, mm -hmm. it would have the best outcome for the client. Yeah, definitely. Definitely agree. Okay, so three, um, you meet an eight-year-old boy not, who is non-verbal um, with no AAC in place. The child regularly hits others, 
in class and the playground. School and parents want to bring in a professional to support communication and reduce frustration. Who should they contact? So we had 15% um, for behavior analyst, and 6% of you voted speech and language therapist. Um, uh, are there any speech and language therapists in the house? We should have done that as a poll. Like, oh, no, yes, true. <laughs> see what the percentage is here. Um, and then we had 79% uh, vote for both professionals. Um, so Cynthia and I also agreed that both professionals would work really well with this. Um, a speech and language therapist um, generally has more training in um, the implementation and assessment of AACs. Mm -hmm. um, so why uh, one AAC may be used over another? Um, and obviously, you know, behavior analysts are great at targeting things and kind of breaking things down in a more in more manageable steps. Mm -hmm. um, how we do so that's essentially why it would be good for both do you want to add anything there um no i mean we'll, we're going to keep coming back to this because i think it ties really well but the, the speech and language service is very good at the what needs to be done and the aba and the behavior analyst is very good at the how it should be done yeah so yeah in this instance the, the bcba would be very skilled at reducing the challenging behavior um working on the once that the speech and language therapist has figured out the um uh the aac that the the bcba would be very skilled at kind of how it should be implemented over time and you know how to break steps down that kind of thing so yeah yeah okay so question four um an iep review highlighted a manding program sorry this question i love it um <laughs> IEP review highlighted a manding program um, was effective in increasing the child's initiating to adults. It was also noted that the child does not engage in joint attending um, during small group activities. What should, who, sorry, who should plan this goal? So we had 29% um, um, for behavior analyst, 10% speech and language therapist, and 60% both. <laughs> Cynthia, do you want to take this? <laughs> it's speech and language therapy, you guys. Um, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a weird one because I never saw it before I was when I was a BCBA I'd be like oh, obviously you know we, we, we can uh, work on joint attending yeah we can definitely do that but we have as a speech and language therapist we have a, we have more training in joint joint attending and the, the kind of cognitive processes that are needed to jointly attend um, I think the ABA side is very good at the kind of outward things like looking um, you know imitating but that the SLT has the kind of below the iceberg type um, understanding, which are the things that need to be in place really before you work on um, any kind of objective um, behaviours. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, that is staggering. So 10% said speech and yeah. answer. 10% of you. Uh, okay, so the last question is, um, a child is beginning to extend their vocabulary of nouns and verbs with the word more emerging more frequently. In the review meeting, uh, you question teaching the word more. The SLT does not agree which professional is right. So we had 23% uh, for behavior analyst, 23%, uh, so equal, um, for speech language therapist, and 54% for both. So we decided that it's both. Um, so as Cynthia, Cynthia mentioned, we are both obviously um, BCBAs first. Um, and this is a real pet peeve of me, <laughs> of mine, using the word more, overusing the word more. Um, so from a behavior analyst <laughs> perspective, uh, of course, we want to increase, um, you know, any child's or any learner's repertoire um, and more sort of restricts that. Um, and it kind of makes them, in my opinion, less of an effective communicator. If you're trying to communicate with someone and, you know, signing more or saying more, more what which is what most of us i would hope would would question um and it's more beneficial perhaps to teach you know the actual noun um or verb you know more jumping or more apple um and obviously from an slt perspective i'll hand over to you cynthia <laughs> so i am in my i have two feet in, in both camps. I completely understand the ABA point of view. And again, this is, I, I came from that background, so I get it. I get that you should teach individual nouns. I totally understand. 
However, I read something the other day from somebody else and it kind of made me think a little bit more deeply. And they said, okay, well, what if you have a child and they're, they're taking a long time actually to learn new words? By teaching them the word more, you're kind of breaking down that barrier and allowing them to demand immediately for that new thing. Not to say that you're not going to teach them um, anything else. You are still being proactive and teaching them new nouns, but by allowing them to sort of um, request for more, for that particular thing or to point or whatever it is you're kind of you're um breaking down that barrier if you weren't to do that you could actually be unintentionally putting a barrier in in for them so they're not able to communicate um what they want they kind of have to either resort to other methods to kind of get to get to get to what they want so i i can understand both points of view i think that you should do both like rochelle said i think you can teach you should definitely be teaching um, nouns um, as, as they go and verbs, um, but you should also consider if the child is taking quite a long time to learn, perhaps teaching more, you know, just the certain things whilst they're learning new things is not a bad thing. And I think it's good to, it's good to understand both perspectives because I never understood the SLT perspective until I became an SLT. I was like, oh, well, that's just ridiculous. You have to just teach the individual words. But if the child's taking quite a long time, you know are we standing in the way of them actually being able to communicate effectively so it's just things to think about yeah definitely okay so just close that out. if i could just jump in and say we've got a couple of comments on this okay so yeah you guys are aware um we've got an attendee that says i've recently been torn on this one i was initially taught never teach more but i also say that if there are problem behaviors it would be better than teaching nothing Yes. Uh, as it would act as a replacement for the problem behavior. Um, another attendee uh, highlights that um, these, these considerations are also interesting for people with profound and multiple learning disabilities or exactly. severe learning disabilities. Yep. Um, and also that you need to consider whether the um, purposes, uh, the communicative purposes, what, what's the communicative, yeah. communicative purpose? Uh, you know, are they manding or are they engaging with you in some other uh, verbal way? Mm -hmm. So just just so you're aware of, we've got a, some discussion going on in the chat as well, guys. Yeah, and there's the really good things to, to point out to, you know, I think it's always, I think the most important thing is if when you're collaborating, it, like I said before, it's really important to think about, if you don't agree with something, you can just say, okay, what's your rationale? I mean, SLTs love the word rationale. So what's your rationale for that? particular thing and they're more than happy to explain why um, and then you you know you can come to some agreement or you know try to try come to some agreement and try to understand from their point of view why why they want to teach the word more sometimes it would be open what they call like power requests so open um, because they don't want to put a barrier in the way but then from the ABA side it's like well you don't want the child to overgeneralize you know and just say more for absolutely everything totally understand so yeah it's it's an interesting one yeah uh okay so now i need to try and share the screen someone put a question uh do you want to read it out michelle i'm just trying well, the last one it's just come in mm. um, i don't i think it's a question but I, I think it's more of a kind of just continuing discussion um, oh okay I, I am keeping track of the Q&A, don't worry. Uh, okay, cool. I will give you some time at some point to start answering those questions as well. Yeah, I think I just, the Q&A specifics, should we just leave into the end? So. Yeah, let's yes, do that. Exactly, yeah. that's why, I, and I told everybody that they can post their questions in the Q&A and in the end, I'm going to give you time to answer them. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, so this is us. <laughs> I can't believe you put that, Rochelle. <laughs> Amazing joy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, this is our lovely well, we've done we've done our introduction now yeah we've done it already that. okie doke okay so um so collaboration um which is you know it's a word that everyone comes across across uh, frequently i would imagine um and essentially it's just you know working together to achieve a common goal and in most situations of course it should be the best outcome for the client um you know, and uh, specific to the article that we um, sent out, um, taken from that, it states that collaboration is suggested in the field um, to be an essential element in service delivery that results in improvement in student outcomes, as well as teacher knowledge and skills. Um, additionally, collaboration is noted as a common characteristic of a variety of consultation mo models, 
um, that result in desirable client outcomes. Um, and a common theme emerging from research suggests that collaborative approach involving shared decision making between professionals leads to the best outcomes. Um, so just you know, take those things into consideration. Um, additionally, what was really uh, in you know enlightening to me reading that article was that um, while collaboration is regarded as an important component of practice in ABA, the degree to which behavior um, behavioral professionals are trained in collaboration is poorly understood. Um, and I don't know about you, but Cynthia and I have had these conversations where I hmm, don't remember ever being taught about collaboration or you know, certain skills that would enhance collaboration. And mm -hmm. they're things you kind of pick up along the way. And I will hold my hands up to say that, you know, I was very, um, I've always been very open to working with others, especially, you know, other professions. Um, however, there was a barrier, um, which obviously we'll come to later, but it's not something that we are trained in or given skills in doing. It's kind of a learn and job type of thing. Um, okay, so scope of practice. So scope of practice um, is essentially is a description of the kinds of problems addressed by a profession. So, you know, what is your remit? Um, and most, most ethical standards require professionals to limit the service delivery to areas within that remit. So with always practice within your scope of practice. And for us specifically, um, obviously the BACB highlights that with uh, code 1.02. And this is from the one that will be effective from 2022. I thought it would be better to actually just put that in instead of one now, because if people are watching this on YouTube, at least they've got the relevant information whenever they watch it in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then we're gonna go into um, the research conducted by um, our friend and colleague Tara, um, and which is actually really great research. Um, if anyone does want further, we have asked permission for this by the way. <laughs> Um, so if anyone does want um, further information about the research, um, you know, just let us know and we can forward you on Tara's um, contact details. Okay. Just to jump in there, sorry guys, and say that our first keyword is going to be scope. Our first keyword is going to be scope. Okay, um, so from Tara's research, she's basically um, done research to see the sort of attitudes and knowledge base of between, you know, SLTs and BCBAs. Um, do they know what each other do? Have they worked well together? Um, so her study kind of covers a, a variety of different things, which we're gonna kind of go through the findings now and some of the questions that, most of the questions that were asked throughout the study. So um, for this one, this uh, sort of bar graph shows um, the SLT's response to the question, what scopes do BCBAs have? So from here, you can see um, what SLTs think BCBAs should be covering. Um, so you've, you've got feeding, swallowing, challenging behavior, um, mental health, academia, speech, language, communication, reading, sport, teaching, and behavior management. So essentially, um, the majority of SLTs involved in this research um, think that BCBA's scope of practice relate to <laughs> challenging behavior, um, communication and behavior management. So those are the biggest um, numbers that we've got there. Oh, sorry, <laughs> okay. um, And then when BCBA's will ask the same question in relation to what scope do SLTs have, um, you can see that the numbers are a lot higher um, across a variety of different areas. So we've got speech, receptive language, expressive language, understanding, social communication, feeling difficulties, swallowing difficulties, foreign languages, um, accent dialect training, pronunciation, um, <laughs> um, challenging behavior, toileting, AACs, play skills, reading, communication, and voice. So, um, yeah, SLTs that, have nothing to do with enunciation, so I'm really glad that no yeah. one did that. <laughs> Interesting. Exactly. Uh, or even accent and dialect training. Wow. Okay. Mm. So there you go. Right, Cynthia, do you want to take this? 
I do. Um, I want to move this up, but I don't know how to do that. Oh. Um, okay, so the next uh, slide was just asking, do you know what a BCBA is? Uh, and actually, it, it was kind of quite close. Um, uh, so uh, the, obviously the winners were, they said yes. Um, but the next one uh, for, were provided with the correct definition. Okay, so here um, we put this in just to show you basically the crossover of scope of practice. Um, and obviously both roles, SLT and BCBA, you know, the list is ongoing there. Um, I'm sure they could have probably put in more. So I'm just going to give a little snippet because it's so small and uh, obviously there's so much information on there, making it bigger just didn't really work with the slides. So I'm just going to read off a couple of um, points from SLT and then I'll go into BCBA and then a few in the middle. So scope for BCBA, some of the um, information included is um, contingency, contingency shaped behavior versus rule-based behavior, respondent conditioning, operant conditioning, um, conditioned and unconditioned motivating operations. We've got positive and negative reinforcement, interventions based on manipulation of antecedents such as motivating operations and discriminative stimulus. Some of the things included for the SLT side included um, normal and abnormal human development across the lifespan, um, speech sound production to encompass articulation, motor planning and execution, phonology and accent modification, um, voice, fluency and fluency disorders, swallowing and feeding. So you can see that the scopes of both are you know, quite vast. And then where we've got a um, crossover in the middle, we have positive and negative reinforcement, a schedule of reinforcement. I'll just highlight here that not most, most, most SLTs probably wouldn't identify in that way. Um, no, but it, I don't think it, so. Definitely used across professions. Um, obviously, shaping, prompts, prompt fading, chaining, um, modeling, task analysis, um, PRIMAC principle, so if then, um, self management strategies, functional communication, training, uh, operant conditioning, generalization. So, there's that's just a few things. Um, and of course, we can, you know, happy to send this across so that people can have a more in depth look. There is the credit at the bottom there that this is taken from. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to highlight that there is a lot of overlap um, with, between the professions. And I think also to note from the SLT side, I think a lot of the time we, they don't know that they're necessarily doing those things, um, but they like, so things like token economy, they might not know that's what it's called, um, or even things like direct instruction, but they'll do them anyway. So there's definitely a lot of overlap and areas that I think they'd be quite unfamiliar they would be familiar with in practice but not necessarily know that it's rooted in behavior analysis and vice versa yeah exactly okay so this is a lovely quote um from uh what kind of what we were saying but I, um about the slt sort of knowing the how part and uh, the bcba is knowing the what part so um, uh, this is the title of uh, Tara's master's uh, dissertation that she did. Okay, so we'll just go um, through the paper, um, talk about the methodology, the results, and then just discuss, um, just go through the discussion, which is um, a lot of the polls and things that we saw before. Okay, so the overview of the paper was to, um, as we said before, to look at the attitudes towards um, both professions from the SLT side and um, uh, attitudes towards ABA, yes, attitudes towards ABA from the SLTs and attitudes towards SLT from the BCBAs. Um, and basically there was a series of questions um, that both were asked and uh, we'll go through them now. Um, so just to kind of give an overview, uh, as an SLT, like looking at both professions, um, so you can see like what the minimum requirements are um, in order to become 
you know, an, a professional SLT or to become a, a BCBA. Um, so within uh, the uh, SLT profession, um, you are classed as an allied health professional. Um, you can work with clients right across the lifespan. Uh, SLTs tend to work in um, hospitals, community, uh, they might work in schools. Um, the minimum requirements are that you have a degree or you have a postgraduate uh, qualification. Uh, and then um, once you have qualified, you have to complete, uh, I think it's one year, what we call NQP, which is um, supervised practice uh, to kind of qualify as a, a fully um, registered professional. Uh, and then you register with the Health and Care Profession Council. Um, it's not actually a requirement that you have to register with the uh, Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, although people do if they want to. Um, you have to maintain your uh, standard. <laughs> it's not as rigorous, shall we say, as the uh, BACB, um, but you have to kind of uh, renew your certification, I think, is it every two years? Yeah. Remember. Um, and you do have to do um, some level of professional development, but um, it's just not, it's as not as rigorous as the PACB, shall we say. Um, yeah, so in the UK, there's approximately 17,000 uh, SLTs. Um, they tend to have uh, bandings within the NHS uh, banding system. So band five is essentially a newly qualified um, SLT who's literally just kind of come out of university and, and kind of passed everything. Uh, and then you'll have, like we said, an NQP um, to write away the cross to um, like a highly specialised SLT who works in a particular area, maybe like a band eight, seven or eight. Um, you also have paraprofessionals, which are what they call speech and language therapy assistants. Um, that's usually like a, a what they call like a band four or three. Um, and that's somebody who is trained to deliver um, SLT interventions. And targets but they wouldn't be trained to um, you know conduct assessments or come up with goals or targets for the child oh we'll do so the governing body is the rcslt uh, royal college of um, speech and language therapists uh, so they kind of um, do like the i think the core sequences um, and they kind of lobby basically for government to make sure that we have good working conditions that sort of thing um, they started in 1945 um, as we said, yeah, membership is not mandatory, uh, but you do have to join the Health and uh, Care Profession Council because the title of speech and language therapist is protected mm -hmm. and we have to abide by the HCPC code of practice. Um, okay, so for the uh, ABA side, um, as you know, everybody knows what it is. Um, essentially in the UK, you, you are a part of the BACB, but um, obviously there's changes now that um, we're sort of recommending that everybody joins the UKSBA because once we part ways from the BACB, the UKSBA will be the regulatory body. Um, as you can see, the kind of governing body, um, like the dates and stuff are much, much later. So, you know, you can see that the RCSLT started in 1945, the, the BACB started in 1998. So there's a, a big difference in how long and how established uh, both governing bodies are. Um, it is mandatory that you're a uh, part of the BACB, obviously, to, to be a BCBA, but in the UK, you, you could technically call yourself a behaviour analyst and actually practice uh, ABA because it's not actually regulated at the moment, but hopefully that will change soon. <clears throat> uh, and uh, yeah, we have to uh, apply by um, the Professional Ethical Compliance Code. We've got a question, and I, I think it might be just a typo, but you say 20 CEUs per year for mm -hmm. the BCBAs. Is that is that it's accurate, 32. or did you mean 32? Yeah, yeah I, I assumed it was a typo, but just to double check. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So then we have uh, speech and language therapy. So obviously, you know, um, we this covers uh, the different approaches towards language acquisition, um, and also the bio medical biological sort of approach to dysphagia difficulties. Um, it's in contrast to ABA, speech and language therapy is not a philosophy or a si or science. It is the practical application of a myriad of different approaches to treat, um, you know 
um, language and communication needs um, across the lifespan. Um, so that's an important difference right there. Yeah, and we also work on swallowing as well, yes. <laughs> which is important. Okay, so can we do the next slide? Um, so what can SLTs offer these CBAs? So um, they can offer specialised you know, knowledge in the development of um, language communication and communication needs. They possess skills to diagnose different speech, language and communication needs. Um, knowledge of typical and atypical development, which is a really big one, mm -hmm. especially as it pertains to speech and language, um, which are really kind of separate. Um, the prerequisites needed for different play, speech and language targets, knowledge base of complex human anatomy, relating to speech, language and communication. Um, and from the training that SLTs receive, um, they are the best in the best position to derive developmentally appropriate targets. Um, so an example of this is the profound knowledge SLTs have in speech production, um, from the skills to transcribing speech. Um, I don't know if I don't know, not too many people may know what transcription is, but essentially each phoneme or sound um, has maybe a symbol, let's call it a symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we are trained, um, it's kind of like its own language, mm -hmm. uh, to trans, we call it transcribing. And so you might say um, dog, as we said earlier, and we would kind of use those symbols to write dog. So that would denote that if someone else from somewhere else, it's international, um, was to was to sort of analyze that speech sample um, from what we have transcribed, they would in to themselves know exactly how the child said it. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I've explained that in a way that's understandable. But yeah, so we use transcribing. Um, so you know that would help us to kind of identify what is going on with a child's speech um, and what they're producing. Um, so, and what maybe sometimes is going on in their oral cavity. So as Cynthia said earlier, you know, was it supposed to be a front sound, but actually they're making the sound in the back of their um, oral cavity. Um, whereas, you know, we could use the ABA principles such as reinforcement and shaping, um, but actually the salt has identified using those methods what has actually caused the issue. Yeah, it's the um, phonetic alphabet. That's the that's the, the one. Okay. Yeah, and we spent a long time learning how to use that. So we love how to use it. Um, yeah, we are obviously telling you what these things are. Please do not um, attempt to try to learn it. Um, I mean, again, I would I would just say that would be out of your scope of practice. Um, it's good to know this information, but to sort of go and try to learn how to transcribe and do it yourself. Um, I would just advise against it, to be honest. Can I, can I ask a question, guys? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking about the poll we did earlier. Mm -hmm. and I was looking at the data and I, you know, I noticed that we were always at least 50% answering both. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at the slides that you've been presenting and the scope of training you know, for, for the BCBAs and the SLTs and so on, do you think that we are not really doing a good job and, and also taking into account the uh, data from the dissertation, do you think that we're not doing a good job at discriminating in clinical settings what should be a BCBA job, what should be a speech and language therapist job, and what should be a job for both? So mm -hmm. do, 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 in your experience, in your clinical experience, do you think that we, we could do better in that sense? Yes. And do you think that affects the outcomes for uh, the clients uh, we support? I do. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, again, Cynthia and I talk about certain things quite a lot. Um, and this is one of the things I, again, will hold my hands up and say, I have definitely been guilty of this. Why is that speech and language therapist working on X? You know, why aren't they working on this? Um, you know, they just need to use something else, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Um, or you think, yeah, we can just work on stuff via echoics. Um, and then you wonder why you're not making progress in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I think that, again, it's always good to have a profession, another opinion, 
you know it doesn't mean it has to infringe on what you're doing or your work but um you know if you really kind of think about your scope of practice and really sort of digest what skills someone else can bring doesn't mean that you can't bring um you know beneficial skills as well but as we talked about you know someone else could probably identify what is going on why it's happening and then you can say look this is how we would work on this um and just kind of have that you know transparency and back and forth um interaction really and just keep it really positive um, I find that those are the best outcomes. Everyone kind of arriving at the table, feeling um, open to work with each other without sort of preconceived thoughts um, of how it's going to go. And you're just going to tell the SLT that this is what we're doing. Doesn't matter what you say, sort of thing, or vice versa. You know, SLT saying I'm not working with a, you know a BCBA, those ABA people. You know, you, you, it it does work both ways. But obviously, we know what I would imagine. Um, a majority of people here are from a uh, behavior analytic background um, just because obviously we're doing it through uh, the uh, university. So I would definitely just say that um, it's just be as open as you can. And obviously, you know, towards the end of the talk, we do have some more on how to enhance that collaboration. I think the other thing that I would add as well is that, yes, I think we do need to get better from both sides, SLTs and uh, ABA courses need to get better at describing other professions. So on my SLT course, I don't think they described uh, what an OT does, um, what the scope of practice is, what a you know, clinical educational psychologist does, or even what a BCBA does. And on the ABA course, I don't think they described what SLTs, OTs or anything like that does. I mean, it doesn't have, you don't have to go into too much detail, but it'd be good to know what people can do so that you know, okay, well, these are my limitations. Um, the other thing is, you know, I, I bang on about this all the time, but get, you know, if you've got an SLT in just to do like, just describe what they do and how they work with the BCBA, that would, I think, alleviate some of those difficulties with understanding where your boundaries are. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, what you know, Rochelle's really um, uh, passionate about it, is practical placement. Like on the ABA courses, we don't have any practical placement really where you go out and you work in a hospital setting or you work in a community setting with other professionals and then you know if you did that you would then know what your scope of practice is because you can see what's going on and what you can do and what you can't do and, and also how you can collaborate together to come up with joint sessions uh, sorry joint goals um you know during mdt meetings that kind of thing um so yeah I, I think we we do need to get better and you know i would say that working in the university to describe what the course what uh, professions are is one way and also just doing practical placements is another way definitely and oh. if asking um about the rationale if you don't understand yeah. or even maybe agree with why another professional has suggested or put something as a recommendation or goal um just ask why you know in a really non um defensive way um you know, oh, well, that's interesting. Or, or why, well, you know, why, have, why do you think that? Or why have you, I'm really interested to why you've made that a goal, like, you know, and then they'll actually, you know, dissect it a bit more for you and kind of tell you, okay, it's because of A, B, and C. Um, kind of, again, you, I feel like you're making really good headway into mm -hmm. a very balanced path. It doesn't need to be you, the, the BCBA is the lead or the SLT is the lead, essentially everyone's picture in mind should be the client mm -hmm. we've got some comments um okay. but one of our attendees says i feel that working in collaboration with other professionals uh, behavior analysts tend to be sometimes jack of all trades mm -hmm. and sometimes you know they don't know what they don't know and we should do better at that because we need to know our boundaries um, another comment says my opinion is that speech and language therapists are underutilized by behavior analysts. Um, equally, the uh, speech and language therapists, though, don't really understand ABA uh, and how we could have that crossover to optimize outcomes. Um, we've got another comment saying that, yes, um, indeed, you know, I, I, I'm working closely with speech and language therapists, and I, I, the more I work with them, I realize how. Uh, you know, naive I was and how many things I didn't know that I now, you know, I'm doing better at. Um, we've got a question for you. 
do you think that the mixed backgrounds of behavior analysts make it trickier to place those boundaries in terms of competence and understand how different professions, um, you know, have different competencies simply because in the sense that, you know, you could have a teacher become mm -hmm. a behavior analyst or you could have someone with psychology training or speech and language training and so on and so forth. Um, you tend to have on the SLT courses, you have people that come from all kind of backgrounds. So on my course, I had people that were teachers. Um, I had uh, somebody else that was an RBT. Obviously, I was a BCBS. You have people that come from a variety of backgrounds. I think the problem with ABA in this country and BCBAs in this country is that we don't have practical placements. We're not regulated yet. So we're not seen as a you are not seen in the same way that other allied health professionals are. Um, we're not invited into schools, you know, part of practical placements. We're not invited into to hospitals settings. So that's part of the problem. And I think because of the way that we tend to start in the, the early, uh, early year settings, working on home programs, where we just do a bit of everything because that's what the child needs. It, it makes us um, think that we can do all of these things. And then when, you know, if we do get an SLT or OT and we, we sort of think, well, you know, I've been doing everything myself. Why do I need to work with this person? Um, and that's that's a problem where it really starts right back at the the kind of the training, essentially how we've had our training and, and the way that ABA has evolved in this country. And it's just something that we need to really think about changing if we're going to if we're going to get better at collaborating and if we're going to be seen as a profession that can work effectively with other allied health professions. Um, but I'd say, it, you know, for those that have already done their training. If you can go out and do some practical placements elsewhere, even in another ABA company, if you can do it, just do it because it's really important, I think, to work with other people and just see how they work. Um, and if you can do a placement with an SLT, even if you just go and observe a session, SLTs love observations. They love um, getting together and chatting and nattering about everything. So if you can do that, just, just do it because I think it will really open your eyes to what other people do, what other professions do and why. And it will get you um, thinking about how you can create, you know, things like joint targets. You know, um, you should always be asking yourself, um, obviously, how can I do this better? But if you can work with somebody else, it takes the kind of, I think it takes the heat off you a little bit. You don't have to worry about an entire program for a child or a young person. If you can just do your bit and let somebody else do theirs, that's great, you know. So, yeah, if you can do some practical placements elsewhere, I would really advise it because I think it would really um, change your practice and make you a better clinician overall. Yeah. I've just got one, one, maybe two things to add to that. Um, I personally have found that being dual certified um, has made it easier. It's made it so much clearer what the boundaries are and what the scope of practice are. Um, and I don't feel like I had that prior to embarking on the um, SLT um, post-grad because as, as it was stated, you know, um, jack of all trades, I was like, oh, yeah, it's great. I can do everything. You know, BCBAs are you know so undervalued in this country mm -hmm. and you know why does so many people not appreciate ABA um and again I still think that but I still I'm more honed into what the scope of practice is um, and as Cynthia said you know um when you're working with other professionals if I if I'm maybe a salt for a child and they do have an ABA program I'm completely hands-off in that direction um, I will ask, you know, sorry, what is the behavior support plan you've got in place um, for X behavior? Um, I'm not just going to go off and say, okay, well, I'm a BCBA as well. I know how to work on this behavior during my speech and language therapy session. I'm going to be consistent with what the ABA program and whoever is heading that program has implemented, you know? So again, I'm just staying within my scope mm -hmm. um, for that role. Additionally, I just wanted to add that not only do um, we obviously have those placements for SALT, but we also have continuing supervision, mm -hmm. which a lot, it's, it's essentially not mandatory for BCBAs. Some people do seek it, um, you know, to kind of better themselves and like check in or continue sort of development in some ways, but it's not mandatory. Um, it's, you know, it's a requirement for speech language therapists and actually, we love it <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it, it you don't realize actually how much that adds to you as a professional um you know reflecting on what you've done why it didn't work yes we definitely um still you know value everything that's objective and that can be <clears throat> documented and you know um taken data on but essentially sometimes you just need to take a step back think about 
what has transpired, what worked, what didn't work, why that, why that was the case. Um, and sometimes talking it out with someone else just kind of allows you to develop and actually, you know, provide more, a better service for, for whoever it is that you're working with. Um, so yeah, I think that's another thing that, you know, just trying to embed like ongoing supervision. I'm not saying it has to be every month. It could be, you know, two, three times a year, but at least having that as a sort of safety net where it's safe zone. Um, a lot, in my experience anyway, I, a lot of BCBAs or even just ABA practitioners that may be consultants, I found it, it's a little bit defensive, um, you know, if, and judgmental, dare I say, um, where you might say, oh, well, you know, I might be, you, you wouldn't want to say I'm having a child that I'm struggling a little bit with. I've tried this, 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 it's not working. Um, you know, really, unless you are quite close with someone um, that is also a BCBA, most of the time that it's like, oh, you're failing. You can't, you weren't able to do it sort of thing. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, do you find that as well, Cynthia, that that's the general? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, again, I think, in, again, I'm just referring to the UK, so sorry to the American people, but it is, it's a very serious problem in this country where I, it, it blew my mind actually when I'd qualified, when I'd done the, 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 um, the, the PG dip in SLT and they're like, yeah, 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 you've got another year until you actually, you know, you're qualified. You're gonna have to do supervision every week, which I did with Tara Wu, um, you know, and, and that really, helped my practice and I wish that I'd had that doing the masters but I just didn't and it, it, I just it, yeah I think you it's so important to have regular contact it doesn't have to be with somebody that's senior to you but it could be even just somebody that you know regular contact where you're going through um clients um and you're you're going through you're being reflective about your practice thinking about what you could constantly consistently improve in what didn't go so well why didn't go so well we don't do enough reflection in in uh, as a BCBA I don't think um, and it's something that I think really needs to be embedded in in courses and just general CEU training going forward like being a reflective practitioner is really important and it's something that I think would then help with collaboration going forward because then you won't have that defensiveness you don't worry about if something goes wrong in a program it's okay and it comes back down to this jack of all trades thing if you're worried about you have to do a bit of everything then something goes slightly wrong you feel like it's your fault but if you're used to working in a group and think something goes wrong you can ask the group what's gone wrong and it's not a problem and I think you know the SLT is a bit you, you have that trained from the beginning um whereas you don't tend to have that on the courses or, or even just in general um because of the way that ABA has kind of evolved in this country yeah I'm kind of conscious of time or something. Yeah, I know we just rambled on for ages to, like whiz through a bit and okay ask some more questions at the end. sure 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 okay so um just quickly so what can bcbas offer slts so they can offer a comprehensive and empirically validated method of teaching um, they can offer evidence-based teaching methods including shaping and chaining procedures prompting um, and basic principles of reinforcement and punishment um, aba provides the how component of teaching um, and uh, also we have an understanding of things like verbal behavior so that helps to break down some of the speech and language um, uh, uh, kind of understanding of language a little bit more um, in, in a bit more detail, essentially. Um, okay, so these are just the uh, previous uh, journals that talked about um, uh, SLT and ABA collaboration. I'll just add that that number of dual certified BCBAs SLTs has grown. I think yes, just over three hundred now. I think in well, the world, yeah. And in the UK, there's eight, eight. I lose track of the number, yeah. <laughs> I think eight. <laughs> um, okay, so these were the questionnaire questions. Uh, so uh, they were offered, they, sorry, they were asked uh, questions, various questions uh, linked to um, previous and current experience, attitudes towards profession, knowledge uh, of evidence-based practice, beliefs on what each profession has to share with the other, and understanding of the profession. Uh, so there are 34 questions in total for the SLT group and 32 for the BCBA group. Um, and they were measured uh, using a five point rating scale. So one was strongly disagree with the question and then five was that they strongly agreed with the question. Just to jump in there and say that our second keyword is 
boundaries. Our second keyword is boundaries. Thank you, guys. Okay, drop on. Okay, so right. <laughs> So these were the questions uh, talking about previous experience. So, um, so the first question, if you can see, um, uh, was asked to the SLT. So what was their previous experience of ABA? Uh, so the highest scoring was uh, none, that they'd had no previous experience of ABA um, or that they'd done some personal research. That was the second. Uh, and then the third was that they had worked with behavior analysts. Okay, and then from the ABA or for the BCBA side, um, most uh, BCBAs who were interviewed had uh, worked with a speech and language therapist. Uh, you can see that there's a really low number that had worked. Um, that had no experience of no it. experience, yeah, or uh, done their own personal research. Or so it's quite interesting. Um, information about SLTs while studying. Like, mm. Okay, so these questions were asked um, to SLTs uh, and it was, uh, they were just asked about um, different statements relating to ABA essentially. So the first one is that ABA is a science. So as you can see, uh, most SLTs were neutral or unsure that uh, ABA uh, is a science. Um, some, so slightly more had said that they agreed uh, and then there's quite a few concerning amount that had said that they disagreed uh, and some that said they strongly, strongly disagreed. By the way, can I just, sorry, interject here. This is, we thought this was a good research to present as more information sharing mm -hmm. and to kind of like get you all thinking about how we are perceived mm -hmm. um, in the sort of like wider UK society um, from, you know, obviously our perspective, speech line therapist, um, you know, and um, to help hopefully guide future interactions and collaborations and mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just a little just a moment there. Uh, so the next one is about how ABA and speech and language can work together. Uh, I can't see what this word is unfortunately because <laughs> do you know what it says? Where? Oh, here. Can you see? I just see disagree. Uh, oh, I no the question is I do not see oh, how that's it. ABA and speech and language therapist therapy can work together. That was a statement. Yeah. Um, so you can see that uh, some here, the most uh, disagreed that they uh, do not see how speech and language therapy and uh, ABA can work together. Uh, quite a lot were neutral and unsure. Uh, and then uh, the third one was uh, strongly disagree, which is a shame. Um, okay, so ABA teaches compliance and control. Uh, yeah, ABA teaches compliance and is compliance training, which is a kind of general standard uh, sort of uh, expectation of what people think ABA is, which is a shame. Um, oops. Uh, so most SLTs have put that they were neutral or unsure. Uh, most, <laughs> the next one was that they agreed, which is a shame. Uh, and then uh, the third one was that they strongly agreed. So I think we have a lot of work to do basically um, with trying to disseminate um, uh, what ABA is and, and how we've uh, moved on from just general compliance training. Uh, okay, the fourth uh, one is uh, ABA is effective. Um, again, which is quite sad to see, uh, most had said that they were unsure, neutral or unsure. Uh, second was that they disagreed and the third was that they agreed that ABA is effective. Yes. Anything to add? No, I don't think so. Okay, so this one is, a uh, statement is that it says that ABA is irrelevant when it comes to speech and language and communication needs. So uh, the most people uh, thought they were neutral or unsure. Uh, the second was that they disagreed, um, that it was irrelevant. Uh, and uh, the third was that they strongly disagreed. Uh, next one is, I know what ABA is. Uh, most agreed that they knew what ABA was. Uh, second was that they were unsure. And then kind of third and fourth 
kind of similar was that they strongly disagreed or disagreed. Uh, okay, so this statement is that ABA teaches important, teaches the client important life skills. Uh, most were neutral and unsure. Uh, second was that they agreed that it teaches important life skills. Uh, and then third was that they strongly disagreed <clears throat> that it teaches important life skills. And then the fourth statement is that ABA is unethical. Most were neutral and unsure, which again, um, I think really highlights how much we need to disseminate what, what ABA um, does and how much we've moved on uh, from perhaps some of the um, dodgy programs in the past. Um, second was that they uh, disagreed that uh, uh, ABA was uh, unethical. And then third was that they agreed, but it wasn't, you know, to a, a large amount. And the last statement, <laughs> this breaks my heart, uh, that ABA is outdated. Uh, and most SLTs put that they were neutral or unsure. Uh, and then disagree and agree, I think disagree slightly wins, uh, came in second and then agree was in third. So I think overall, I think the, the, the main thing to take away is that, you know, in the UK, we, de we need to do a lot more work to really disseminate what we're good at um, and answer some of those questions. If people are saying that they think ABA is unethical, you know, what can we do to show that we're not unethical as, as practitioners um, and uh, that we're not outdated? And, and part of that is, you know, showing that we can actually collaborate with people effectively um, and also hold our hands up and say, look, yeah, there are some dodgy programs and these are the reasons why, but, you know, this is how we can work together to show that, you know, I'm not dodgy or ABA is not dodgy. I'm not dodgy. <laughs> I'm not dodgy. <laughs> ABA is not dodgy. Um, okay. Do you want to do the SLT one? Let me to do this, Cynthia. I'm just yeah. going like, to through it because it's, unless people are going to say, um, we've got about 20 minutes. Okay, cool. So, um, before, so before you go into what speech uh, what behave so this is behavior analyst and what yes. they think about speech and language therapists right okay so before mm. you go to that just to say uh, we've got a couple of comments and one of them i think is relevant to share now mm -hmm. that um we've got an attendee that says it's interesting to hear about bcbas and speech and language therapists in other countries because it's different here in canada for mm -hmm. uh, autistic children accessing behavioral services speech and language therapy and occupational therapy and there is a more collaborative way um, through early intervention programs that uh, in it seems that they are also embedded in schools. Mm -hmm. So just to say that, um, give you the opportunity maybe to comment on this, on you know that you know the fact that it, it seems that in the UK and I, potentially in Europe, although I can't speak for all European countries, mm -hmm. maybe we're quite behind in that sense. Would you would you think yeah, that that's the case? We are. I think we are because our education system and healthcare system is very different. Um, in order to get ABA in this country, you have to families essentially have to self fund. Um, so it's very, it's very isolated. Kind of starting an ABA program, you kind of do it in isolation, and then you get you you kind of win the funding through the local authority, and then at that point you might have an SLT that comes in. So it's it it is it's just a different way of, of kind of starting up services. Whereas my understanding in America and Canada is that it kind of goes through, well, I think Canada's um, not insurance system, but it kind of goes through um, uh, going to a center and, and all of that. And we don't, we just don't really have that system here. Um, so we definitely are behind, I think. Um, yeah, because of the difference in structure. Yeah. What Cynthia said, like self-funded here versus maybe insurance-based or other centers in US and Canada. The whole thing is just very different. Um, whereas, you know, in the US, if a child, okay, I'll just say here pri primarily most people are doing e EIBI programs or some form of ABA, um, that essentially would be covered by an insurance. And parents don't have to worry about, um, you know, how are they going to fund it or where they're going to find providers, that sort of thing, because they can get a list from their insurance providers um you know they also have um because of the that system insurance companies you know they always generally take things on that are evidence-based and proven to be effective and you know they do their own sort of research into things where so it's it's more accepted 
Um, it's not frowned upon if you are thinking about ABA or discuss with someone else or a different practitioner about ABA. Whereas here, um, within the UK, I might be wrong, but I think a lot of the times they're still, oh, you're going to do, oh, that ABA. Mm. Oh, I haven't heard good things about that. So it can essentially put families off um, a professional you're going to work with or hope to collaboratively work with already has a stereotype about the type of person you are and the sort of profession that professional background you're coming from so it it already is not in a great place um which is a shame so yeah we are definitely behind um and i think it just builds into again how we are disseminating aba um or behavioral analysis as a whole um you know how we are conducting ourselves professionally i'm not saying anyone people don't act professionally but you know in terms of the attitudes that go with it um the jack of all trades being a bit more malleable with how we're working with other professionals um i think that all kind of feeds into each other i, just, I was going to say actually the other thing the key thing i think with the us and uk is that aba is seen as a medical need and um, uh, in the us and uh, aba is seen as an educational need here so you just don't have because it's not funded by uh, if it's not seen as a medical need in the uk it's not going to be funded by the nhs it would need to be done through getting an educational healthcare plan which takes time um and as rochelle said families usually have to self-fund so it's just parents make have to make a really difficult decision is you know do i um you know attempt to kind of go down the route of getting some slt and o ot um, or do I just self-fund for ABA essentially and then you know try and get an EHCP so there's just all these kind of difficult decisions um, partly because of our socialized healthcare system love the NHS obviously love it love love it but you know that's just one of the pitfalls that we have um, where essentially they're looking to kind of <laughs> save money um, and you know ABA is ex it's expensive it's an expensive um, uh, especially early intervention stuff is expensive um so it's it's seen as well we just kind of wait till the child's four and then you can you know ask for it in the ehcp so it's just all those kind of systems in place mean that the way in which aba has been perceived over the years um is quite negative um uh for various reasons uh partly because of the the, the because it's seen as an educational need and partly because it's just been quite unregulated for such a long time it's left the door open for people to to um to kind of just do bad programs essentially um and um for people to kind of trash it and you know us to not have a kind of be part of the H um hcpc or anything like that it's been quite difficult um i think for us to um grow as a profession i think anyway okay should we go over these slides because I'm keen to hear what the other uh, point of view is and then yeah. we've got we've got uh, quite a few questions in the Q&A so maybe let's work through these slides yes. so we can leave about 10 minutes in the end at the sure. end so you guys can answer the questions thank you I kind of whiz through these <laughs> um, I'm not gonna go through each one <laughs> you guys quickly just read the top bit is the statement um art and um here you can see the responses um as from, you know, just at, at a glance, you can see that generally speaking, BCBAs have a slightly better and higher opinion of SLTs. Um, so, I think the key one for me just on this one is just that the SL, uh, BCBAs are unsure that um, SLT is uh, based on any kind of science, <laughs> which I think from an SLT perspective, we do need to get better at, you know, showing that, you know, there, there are evidence based uh, <laughs> things, <laughs> you know, programs and interventions that we can reference. So, yeah, I always I also find that speech and language therapy is effective. The like amount that's unsure mm. uh, is quite high. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like you know it's equal to agree but um that, yeah it's quite high there and i think again it's because we don't understand fully why slts do certain things mm -hmm. so i would always say well why are you working on <laughs> why are you working on speech sounds um or why are you working on you know 
that they're saying this when you know no one really understands what they're saying um obviously this is like years and years ago and um, i don't even think i was bcba when i had these sort of thoughts but um essentially you know there's actually a whole prerequisite to even starting to work on speech sounds which is taught via you know this slt um route you know whether you're doing a bachelor's degree or a postgrad diploma or postgrad degree it, they teach you like there's these prerequisites before you even work on speech sounds mm -hmm. that is but i never worked i never asked a rationale i just would say um i think you know parents are really keen and we've got some speech going on um but really unintelligible and you know x y and z um can we work on it? oh no no let's just use you know an aac or makaton or i'm just working on i'm working on um and um, what is it attention box um oh uh, you know what i mean autism attention oh I can't it was called. attention autism oh, no, not attention autism um surprise box that's it oh surprise right surprise box or whatever but even though i personally still don't use surprise box um it still works on attention you know eye contact some of the prerequisite skills to working on mm -hmm. specific speech sounds and um, it's actually really hard um for kids to sit focused to when you're going at like speech sounds so um again a bit of the rationale there but i think that's why that bit for un unsure was so high like what are you doing i can do this as a bcba okay so going into this session okay so um overall bcbas as i said you know has um, a more positive outlook towards uh, SLTs than the other way around, um, but both professions acknowledge that they could, you know, learn some things from each other and share knowledge. Um, there weren't any clear trends for um, SLT data and mixed attitudes, and the BCBA group showed stronger trends in their attitudes in the SLT group. Uh, largely, that BCBAs held SLTs in high esteem, um, and both showed poor understanding in the scope of each other, which is, I think, really. Mm. <clears throat> Oh, here it is. Well, uh, okay, so the main thing is that caution should be taken um, when, when interpreting the findings because of the um, limitations due to um, restricted statistical analysis of the results. Um, both professions demonstrated a good evidence, uh, good understanding of evidence-based practice, and were eager to learn and collaborate with each other, which is really important. Um, SLTs had significantly less practical experience of ABA than BCBAs did of S uh, speech and language therapy. Um, and both professions agreed that multidisciplinary teamwork is vital for clients and the development of the profession. Uh, yeah, and uh, BCBAs generally held SLTs in uh, higher esteem than the other way around. And I think from the SLT part, it's just because you just literally have no training. Like we don't work BCBAs in practice at all. So a few steps here, um, next steps and future directions. Um, I'll don't read them out for you. <laughs> I'm trying to like, be cautious of the time. Um, but yeah, essentially, I think most of the things that we've already highlighted throughout the, the, this talk, um, I think it's important for us to kind of, you know, move on to highlight the barriers that we have found um, that can kind of restrict effective collaboration. Okay, so definitely effective barriers, uh, barriers of to effective collaboration can be um, limited consultation and training skills. So kind of what I was talking about before, if you don't have much clinical practice of working with other professions, it's going to be difficult to, um, I think, work collaboratively in an, a multidisciplinary team. Um, and it can also just limit your overall skill set. Um, I think that I might be wrong, but um, I feel like behavior analysts might do this a little bit more just because of what we've spoken about in terms of jack of all trades and um, us kind of taking on a lot of the load ourselves um you know whereas slt i, I feel like they might be a little bit more laid back but most of the time um so yeah just be wary of encroachment obviously again scope of practice which sort of feeds into encroachment anyway because uh, we think our uh, uh, scope of practice is so vast which you know most of the time it is don't get me wrong 
um, but that leads us to encroach on another profession. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of ABA specific jargon, which, you know, essentially um, our code tells us that we should really be uh, doing it to the listener as well. It doesn't mean that we can't say manding, tacting, but most of the people that you interact with find that overwhelming. They find it a little bit isolating and they don't really know what you're working on or why because of that. Um, so maybe just be a bit mindful of that. Um, a lot of the time, even how we write reports um, can be sort of restrictive for other professionals to understand what it is that we are identifying as needs um, and also recommendations. Um, example, X child um, has um, a weak man repertoire. <laughs> um target will have 20 mans within x amount of time across three sessions or something uh three consecutive sessions eight minimum 80 percent so that sort of uh the jargon you could easily just say um you know x child um has difficulties or finds it challenging to make requests brackets manned or vice versa manned then brackets requesting things like that kind of help bridge the gap stereotypes and biases um again both sides you know generally have prejudgment and that can be a little bit close-minded um again i think more so slts maybe towards aba if they've had a bad experience in the past where trying to collaborate with someone was really um i won't say not beneficial but difficult and challenging um and you know that closed-mindedness. Oh, the those ABA people, um, it, BCBAs thinking of SLTs, uh, maybe wishy-washy targets, um, not evidence-based therapeutic interventions. Um, so things like that. Sometimes just ask again. I feel like that leads into the rationale. Ego, definitely leave the attitude at the door. Um, ego, I'm right, I'm right, doesn't overall benefit the learner. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for this, guys. Uh, I am very keen to give you the opportunity to answer the questions as well. So mm -hmm. I will let's stop there. Okay. Just to say, because I'm aware that some people might want to go, the last keyword is ego. The last keyword is ego. You can send it to me via email, but don't use it in your everyday work. Okay, guys, that's the, that's the message for that one. Uh, okay, so we've got we've got the questions, and I'm I'm going to um, um, work through them now for you guys. The first one says, I, "I'm actually I'm going to leave the first one for the end because I think it's a great question for us to uh, finish with." So the the first question is, "Can you tell us more about the link between speech and language therapy work and accent dialect training?" not sure how speech and language therapists are involved in this and how having an accent speaking or speaking a dialect would be a speech and language problem. Uh, what am I missing here? So could you guys clarify this for us? It's not. It's not. Um, I think that was a... <laughs> just kind of put that in there. Thrown in there as a, as a uh, just to see if people thought that that's something that SLTs do. Um, but no. Okie dokie. Um, the next one says, situation advice, please. Um, where a speech and language school communication program is, when a, a, a speech and language school communication program is school wide and the learner is not an effective functional communicator at home, which results in severe aggression, we've got the speech and language therapist who is not keen to adjust uh, the program as small games are made over long time. Um, the best way to get to get joint collaboration. What's the best way to get joint collaboration so functional communication can um, act as a alternative behavior to challenging behavior, and then move more towards a language-based communication. So, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it basically says, you know, when when the speech and language therapist is not really keen to make changes to their program, they, and you know, clearly they've set up a program and they think that works well, but it doesn't at home, at least. Mm -hmm how would you approach this so that you can get the um, best results for your client? 
I personally would say data. Yeah. yeah. That loosely, um, because I wouldn't say, well, here's like 50 sheets of data. <laughs> Uh, you know, see, you know, I was right. Um, I would just, if you, it sounds like from that scenario, a, a rationale might have been asked, you know, why are you doing, have you put this in or, you know, why don't you want to sort of modify the target um, or how you're targeting it? Um, I would then maybe take data or get parents to sort of loosely take data um, to see that this is what's happening at home we're getting this much communication versus this much challenging behavior. Um, we kind of we do need something else in place. Um, and generally sort of, you know, having that to back you up, is presented in a very non-defensive way. Mm -hmm. um, should, in my, in my experience, it's usually, um, oh, okay, wow. Yeah, let's, let's figure this out. And it's just about buttering them up and just saying, look, you know, I can see that you've done a fantastic job in school because he's able to request this amount. But, you know, at home, I think it would be really great if you could come and just do, you know, help replicate what's going on at home, because um, we, I think we're having some difficulty and it'd be really great to get your input. What do you think, you know, could be could, could you come and do a visit? Um, and if they say no, just say, OK, well, what's the reason for that? Um, and like Rochelle said, just ask the parents if they can support as well. Okay, thank you for that, guys. The next question says, when you're duly certified, how do you know what becomes your scope of practice? Um, surely you overlap. So is it easier to separate certain things if needed? How do you know which brain you need on in the sense of, you know, your SLT brain or your BCBA brain? That's a good question. Yeah, I think I can't kind of touched on this earlier. Um, I think it depends on the role that you are kind of commissioned to undertake. Um, if I am a BCBA and, you know, the family or the child is receiving SLT input from somebody else, my remit is, you know, generally speaking, ABA. Mm -hmm. um, if they wanted to talk about um, the phonological process or sort of developmental um, sequence of sound acquisition, then I understand that fully. If they wanted to show me what they had transcribed, I understand that fully. However, I would say, okay, so what is your plan? Um, you know, how would you want to go about it? You see what I mean? Um, and then again, generally speaking, they would say, this is my plan, these are the targets. Um, if there was something that I didn't agree with based on what I know or have learned from my SLT background, I would just revert back to what is your rationale? Oh, is there a reason you've kind of chose that that's really interesting I kind of try to use very like neutral um, language mm -hmm. um, and then kind of take it from there um, I might say oh have you heard of this or have you ever used this um, see what they say and that I've, I've heard it's really you know it's got some evidence base behind it you know maybe we can try what you're doing and um, you know maybe at some point if that doesn't work perhaps we could use that. Um, that's kind of how I generally go about it or vice versa, if I'm just the salt. I, I don't generally cross over into um, the BCBA remit, anything to do with um, what they're working on in their ABA program. Um, when I, if I, generally speaking, in most situations, the ABA program is in place first and then they get salt. So I always am happy to read what the report is, see what the ABA targets are, read the behavior support plan, so that if there is actually anything that's, which generally there is, um, sort of come up or flagged up on both sides, I'm going to say, look, clearly this is a problem across the board. Um, that's your target. I'm going to kind of make my target tie in with yours so that we've got that sort of consistency and can kind of generalize it straight, straight away. Um, so I personally don't find a difficulty in that uh, i think you're right michelle what you said before which was spot on it's just like it's it's so much easier now to to differentiate what your role is as a bcba and what your role is as an slt because you've got because you've got both so i i am the same i if i am an slt on the case i just i'm happy to just do the slt stuff and vice versa it's so yeah. much easier to be honest so yeah thank you thank you for that the next question says have you cross published in speech and language journals and behavior analytic journals do you think ABA and speech and language therapy are open to cross-publishing and will it help build 
working relationship. There was a journal a while ago that was the uh, SLT, I'm sure, but I don't think there was that many, um, what's the word? That, that many of them. I think there was only four and then that was it. But yeah, no, I think, and there's the SLP group, isn't there, on Facebook? Yeah, there's um, a yeah I think, yes, um, we, you know, the more um, research that's done um, with the two professions together, the better, um, definitely. And the more it's kind of shared in on courses and, and the more these kind of groups and stuff happen, then yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Apparently, there used to be an SL, SLP ABA journal. Yeah, that was it. No, yeah. Longer, no, no longer published, apparently. Right. That's a shame. Yeah. And there is, for those of you, uh, there is a link uh, in the chat box if anybody's interested to check that out. Oh, thanks, Tara. <laughs> so the next question says, recently, NHS has started to require more BCBAs. Do you think this will help and change things in terms of how behavior analysis is perceived in the UK? I think that's a tough one. Um, maybe yes and no. Um, it's great that, you know, the NHS is promoting these places and, you know, finding roles within the NHS for BCBAs. Um, but I think that, again, here, so many of us work either independently or for um, other companies that maybe you know eibi slash aba program based that the transition from that into the nhs is a very very different place um yeah i, I think that uh we are in that structural process now of like change um but i think from the ground up from the trainings all of that it just needs to change you know essentially apart from if you are an actual BCBA or an RBT, there are a sort of big population of people who are not actually, you know, certified. So what are they following an ethical code? Um, I know they probably wouldn't be able to get an NHS job, but if they did then try to go down that path, it, I feel like it might be quite difficult for them because, you know, have you, what ethical code have you been following? Um, you know, that structure of banding, um, it's just something that isn't fully embedded into what, how we practice here. So I, I think, yeah, I think it's going to take time. I think it's a positive step that the NHS recognise and some local authorities recognise that um, BCBAs are valuable. Um, but like Michelle said, I think, it, you know, it, it comes from the training, absolutely. Um, it comes from... Uh, practical experience and then and then you you do have the question of okay once we've changed everything over what are we going to do unless a behavior analyst is a protected title like speech and language therapist is what are you going to do with those people that are still out there practicing ABA what do you know what I mean so unless something happens where essentially somebody is you know something happens where they're taken to court or something I don't know you're going to have this weird kind of middle ground of people who have a, a part of the NHS or part of a, a, a company or a system and then these people kind of in the middle who are still saying that they're doing ABA you know you just don't have that in speech and language therapy and I know it's an older profession but I think right from the get-go it was regulated and I think yes it's positive but we've got a, we've got a long way to go and we shouldn't underestimate that um, and we all really really need to get better at um, calling dodgy programs out but also um disseminating you know how important it is to become a bcba how important it is to be a member of the uk sba and all that kind of stuff because we need to make it you know just a general practice that you you do the masters you do practical placement you become a member of the sba uk sba and, and that the behavior analyst is a protected title and that's what you should be aiming for the next question says what are some of the prerequisites that speech and language therapists uh, should teach before targeting echoic behavior, echoics? Do you think BCBAs should not work on uh, echoic behavior? Um, no, I think echoics are, you know, you can be, you can use echoics for a lot of different things. You know, you can do um, echoic to tax transfers and stuff. I would never say not to use echoics. I think that, um, I think that might be in relation to something I said earlier um, where you might just be trying, a child might say um, for chocolate, for example, 
chocolate and you might try to get an echoic um, with chocolate, 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 chocolate up to five times and it's still ochlet. Uh, you know, essentially an echoic program um, or working on echoics is very unlikely um, if there's other things going on, such as the phonological process to improve that. Um, so that's where I'll just like clear that up. Um, you know, but I definitely, there's definitely, of course, value in echoics. You can yeah. use so many different things. Excellent, thank you. So the last question, and uh, thank you for all of you who are still with us. Um, so the last question says, I'm a PBS clinical lead and I'm also an SLT by profession and I'm giving a lecture to speech and language therapy students next week on positive behavior support, but I've only got an hour. So I've written my lecture, but I'm super curious. What's the one point you both would love me to get across to the new speech and language therapists who don't have your background? Learn about, it's really important to learn about reinforcement and prompting. Sorry, sorry, I've just put it out there. It's really important. <laughs> uh, I think that um, for me personally, a lot of SLTs don't realise actually a lot of the stuff they do is <laughs> rooted in ABA. Rooted in ABA principles. So I would definitely say that um, for me, when I'm like, oh, you know, PEX or, um, you know, you're now a next yeah <laughs> things like that i think it, it could literally be like a bullet point um yeah so you know these things are actually from other other areas you know it's not made by slts or um i think that would help with their attitude towards aba slash pbs and i mean pbs is a bit more widely accepted i would say mm -hmm. but, um, i think that is what i would say um while i was doing the slt course i found that a lot oh you're an eight you're an ABA person and I'm like oh no we don't do that here though and I'm like oh but you're using an our next board um or but you were, <laughs> um, you know obviously those are just two well-known examples but I think that if those attitudes kind of could change a little bit um it would be easier for BCBAs to engage as well I would also add just say, you know, ABA has really come a long way and I'm sure you will, but it's come a long way. And, uh, you know, a lot of programs and reputable consultants and organizations are really working on a lot of the same child centered programs and, and targets that SLTs work on. And again, I would urge students if they can try and, you know, if you can sit in on an ABA, a decent ABA program or, you know, um, uh, meet up with a, a, see something that's kind of reputable and good, it would show, I think that, ABA isn't as controversial as people say um, and that a lot of the targets um, and things that they do would look like a, very much like a speech and language therapy session as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for this. And thank you, uh, Cynthia. Thank you, Rochelle. No problem. It was, was really, really informative. And I think everybody really enjoyed it, considering that we've got so many people still here um, listening to us uh, talk about collaborative work. Um,